Hello, I'm Hannah Donnett with The Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Changer is bringing the latest environmental health science through our partnerships, calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar titled Supplemental Science and Regulatory Challenges. Our moderator today is Karen Wing, founder of Because Health and director of CHE. We'll leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions in the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentations. After the presentations, our, moderators, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We'll get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those who have called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 70 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Karen. Great, thanks so much, Hannah. And welcome everyone to today's webinar on supplement science and regulatory challenges. Um, I'm sure that many members in our audience today may take a daily multivitamin or even as winter approaches, add in vitamin C or maybe some elderberry syrup when you feel cold coming on. Dietary supplements like these are widely consumed by the public. But what do we really know about the quality, safety, and efficacy of these supplements? Thankfully, today we have two experts here to give us an overview of supplement science and to tell us about the latest analytical methods for assessing botanical dietary supplements. Our first speaker today is Dr. Paul Coates, who is the president of the American Society for Nutrition. He directed the Office of Dietary Supplements at the NIH from 1999 to 2018 in its mission to strengthen knowledge and understanding of dietary supplements. Through a range of initiatives by an energetic and knowledgeable staff, he established ODS as a strong and authoritative voice for rigorous science in dietary supplements and related areas of nutrition. He was the acting director of the NIH Office of Disease Prevention from 2010 to 2012, and also served from 1996 to 1999 as deputy director of the Division of Nutrition Research Coordination at the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. I cannot mention everything else that is in his extensive biography, so I encourage you to go to our webpage to read the um, rest. But we'll mention that in 2011, he received the Conrad A. Elfheim Award from the American Society for Nutrition for Public Service in Nutrition. And in 2013, he became a fellow of the ASN and has served in numerous roles on the ASN Board of Directors. He is also the author of more than 180 publications and the editor of four books. We are um, quite lucky to have him today. Our second speaker is Dr. Cynthia Ryder, who is a toxicologist with the National Toxicology Program and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, where she serves as project leader for a diverse portfolio of testing programs, including polycyclic aromatic compounds, botanical dietary supplements, and industrial chemicals. She received her bachelor's of science from Tulane University in environmental studies and biology and her PhD from North Carolina State University in environmental toxicology. She completed her postdoc training in the reproductive toxicology branch of the National Health and Environmental Effects Research Laboratory um, at the United States Environmental Protection Agency and the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University. Um, we are looking forward to her talk um, and we are so lucky to have both of our speakers today. Um, so with that, Dr. Coates, I will turn it over to you today for our first presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Karen and Hannah. It's a, a, a delight to be with all of you today. Uh, I'm just gonna go quickly through uh, the just a second, I'm trying to use my, there we go. Uh, those are my disclosures. Um, here's what I'm gonna talk about today. 
a, 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 an introduction to dietary supplements, uh, a, a little bit of a sweep through the regulatory challenges associated with these products in the not just the U.S. marketplace, but also around the world. And then I'm going to use the Office of Dietary Supplements as a case study to talk about research resources and translating the, uh, in, the results of the science of dietary supplements into useful information for the public. And then I'll wrap up at the end. Brief thing uh, for those of you who've seen this before, sorry, uh, but uh, we are the child of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, commonly known as DSHEA. DSHEA amended the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act uh, to define what a dietary supplement is, to assure that consumers had access to dietary supplement products. It also established the regulatory framework for dietary supplements. And just a reminder, that's as foods, not drugs established rules for what a dietary supplement label should contain, and gave the Food and Drug Administration the authority to write uh, good manufacturing practices that were specific to dietary supplements. It also amended the Public Health Service Act in the very last paragraph of the Deshaies document to create the Office of Dietary Supplements at the National Institutes of Health. And as Karen mentioned, I was director for a long time there. Uh, and uh, I'll be telling you a little bit about uh, how we operated in trying to uh, work in this interesting area. A brief word about what dietary supplements are. Uh, they are obviously intended to be taken by mouth, and they're intended to supplement the diet. There are some uh, interesting variations on the theme about that last part. So a lot of the very... Um, uh, commonly uh, understood and consumed ones are vitamins, minerals, amino acids, fatty acids. But there are also other components of foods, so-called bioactives, that uh, are present in dietary supplements. And this includes a wide range of product uh, of compounds such as flavonoids. It also includes herbal extracts and ingredients such as turmeric and cinnamon. And of course, these, what I've just described, are mostly things that are in the diet to begin with, so supplementing the diet from some, uh, some level. But in the United States, almost uniquely around the world, uh, the category of, of dietary supplements includes botanical products that are not generally part of the diet. So, for example, echinacea, ginkgo, and St. John's wort. There are also other non-food ingredients probiotics, prebiotics, melatonin, chondroitin, and so on. There are lots of ways in which dietary supplements can be administered or, or produced and sold uh, as tablets, as capsules, as liquids, as powders, as chewable gummies, and so on. Products can be a single ingredient product, multiple ingredients, or complex uh, proprietary formulas or some combination of those. Just to give you a, uh, a sense of the size of the industry, uh, for every year since 1994, the Nutrition Business Journal has published uh, its version of the sales of dietary supplements in the United States. The, the product category was roughly $4 billion in 1994, so there were already products in the marketplace. But now, in, or in the most recent iteration of their report for 2020, uh, that number has gone uh, th through the roof to $55 billion for 2020, and one sees no uh, slowdown at all uh, in sales. Most people in the United States who consume dietary supplements do so, as Karen said, uh, a multivitamin, multimineral combination, uh, so-called MVM, although there are really very wide differences in the composition of multivitamins and, and minerals. There's no regulatory definition for that particular product. It just has more than one vitamin and or more than one mineral. Uh, as uh, nutrients, 
they can contribute a lot, sometimes more than the uh, than 100 percent of the recommended dietary allowance to the daily intake of nutrients. And if they're not accounted for in assessing dietary intake, can lead to an underestimate of the uh, intake of nutrients and also underestimate the potential for excessive exposure. I'm not trying to scare you uh, with that last statement uh, because the chances of uh, overexposure to vitamins and minerals uh, does not happen all that often uh, even with uh, dietary supplements uh, and there are rare but measurable uh, adverse events associated with the uh, in high intake of some uh, vitamins and minerals. There is widespread use by the public. So more than 50 percent of adults in the U.S. consume these products on a regular basis. And uh, this is relevant to people like me, more than 75 percent of adults uh, older than 71 years of age take dietary supplements. And I'll show you a little more of this in a moment. Here are some very general uh, uh, features of the patterns of dietary supplement use in the U.S. Females tend to consume more than males. White Americans tend to consume more than black Americans. And other elements uh, um, can uh, affect use, such as socioeconomic status, education, and background diet. Um, the motivations that people use to, uh, to consume dietary supplements are to supplement the diet, to provide so-called nutritional insurance, to maintain health, to enhance so-called performance, and there are any number of categories there, uh, cognitive performance, athletic performance, sexual performance. Um, other reasons that people report for taking dietary supplements are to prevent disease and sometimes to treat disease. That's important to recognize since companies are not permitted to market products expressly for the prevention or treatment of disease since those are uh, by their very nature drug-related claims. So you'll occasionally find that a product will, uh, will claim that it is being used to treat COVID and that's not permitted. Uh, and when the FDA and or the Federal Trade Commission find you, they will take your, help you to take your products off the marketplace. Um, this is a slide that was developed based on the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, in part from work that in, uh, originated in the Office of Dietary Supplements by Reagan Bailey, who's continued her work on motivations and, and patterns of dietary supplement use uh, now that she's a senior faculty member at Purdue University. What I wanted to show you here was that uh, beginning in early life, you can see that about a sixth of kids before the age of one are reported to be taking dietary supplements. These are usually drop-based things like trivisol, multivisol, and so on, um, vitamin D perhaps, iron, uh, and then the use of dietary supplements, again, mostly uh, vitamins and or minerals, increases through the first decade, declines somewhat during the second decade, and then continues to increase relentlessly until, as I mentioned, people in their uh, more older, uh, older Americans tend to consume quite a, uh, quite a lot of product. It may be one dietary supplement, it may be several, but this is the, uh, the regular use of dietary supplements in the population. Um, just to provide a little more texture, I mentioned that males and females differ in their uh, use of dietary supplements, and that's a statistically significant difference. I also mentioned that there's a steady rise in supplement use in adulthood uh, from uh, the 20s to the 40s to the 60s and above. And th this slide also shows the, the difference between a non-Hispanic white uh, population versus non-Hispanic black and Hispanic populations in the United States. 
This is an, it's such an interesting marketplace. Uh, and uh, in part, the challenges uh, to uh, the regulation of dietary supplements have a, a bit of a basis in the fact that so many people use dietary supplements. It's a way of life. From my perspective, it's a public health issue. And I iterate one more time that in the United States, the regulation of dietary supplements follows food rules and not drug rules. So for example, there's no pre-market approval or product registration of dietary supplements. However, manufacturers are required to assure that their products are safe and they are expected to maintain records uh, that document whatever they say about the product on their label. Um, the FDA can regulate products post-market, but not pre-market. And the FTC can enforce advertising rules, and both of them often do. Another complication is that the United States may uh, regulate dietary supplements as a branch of foods, but in other parts of the world, they can be drugs or foods, or dietary supplements, or biologics, or natural products, and the list goes on. In addition, uh, there is a, a word game that's played uh, that uh, names can be invented with no regulatory meaning. So uh, nutraceuticals and phytoceuticals sound very official, but they have no regulatory uh, meaning. However, across the world, there are some common elements that exist for products in this category. Uh, the requirement for good manufacturing practices, for adverse event reporting, for documentation of claims, and for labeling. And regardless of the regulatory framework, wherever it is in the world, the need for scientific evidence still exists. I'm going to talk to you a little about how the U.S. scientific effort works. And while a lot of that work emanates from the Office of Dietary Supplements, by no means is the ODS the only place in the federal uh, government where this work goes on. And I think you'll see in a moment that it requires a lot of collaboration in order for this to work properly. So ODS has been guided by a, a series of strategic plans uh, since its early days. This is the most recent one. Uh, uh, an updated version of the strategic plan uh, is in the works now, beginning in 2022. Here's how we, we thought about, and the office still thinks about, what are the priorities for research and, and other activities that the ODS engages in. Probably the key one is, what's the public health issue? Uh, is it safety? Um, is it very huge use? Uh, is there evidence emerging of potential efficacy that needs to be further followed up? Uh, following on from that, and a bit of a subset is, how are nutritional status and bioavailable levels of dietary supplement metabolites measured? Are the measures reliable? What are the, what's the evidence for the health effects of dietary supplements, whether positive or negative, and at what level? And then how should ODS and the broader research community fill the gaps in knowledge? And finally, and this is a key part of the ODS strategy, is how do you translate the results of research for policymakers, clinicians, and especially for the public? So the scientific challenges uh, are numerous, and here are some fairly obvious ones. The widespread use of dietary supplement products in the U.S. is largely based on observational data that show an apparent benefit, but you and I know that observational data uh, cannot be used to prove cause and effect. There have been very few, in the cosmic sense, uh, interventional studies, most of which have failed to document either obvious benefit or obvious harm. And I've provided a few exceptions to that rule here. One of the most formidable is that folic acid, whether as a fortificant in foods or in, in a supplementation strategy, will reduce the risk of neural tube defects. Uh, the ARIDS formula, so-called um, 
age-related eye disease uh, study formula reduces progression of macular degeneration uh, in a subset of the, of the population. By contrast, supplementation with beta-carotene will increase the risk of cancer in tobacco users, and vitamin E supplementation may increase the risk of prostate cancer. Uh, these are based on fairly large studies, so they're unlikely to be overturned, but you, you d never know because it's possible that no study can be large enough to actually prove this uh, for, with certainty. There are lots of things that affect the impact of a dietary supplement ingredient, and the key one, I think, is background diet. As I mentioned, we can get nutrients uh, like vitamin D and vitamin C and calcium from foods as well as from dietary supplements. And the status of those nutrients may very well affect the response. A good example of that is vitamin D, where the background vitamin D status, which is measured as the uh, the serum level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D, if it's in the normal range, it seems likely that any response to exogenous or supplemental vitamin D won't, won't be seen. It's only in those folks who have evidently low levels of vitamin D measured by 25 hydroxy vitamin D in serum will see a response. There is often uh, an inevitably huge variability among products. So uh, these can provide some, uh, not barriers, but challenges to, to research. And among the things that the Office of Dietary Supplements uh, has done over the years is to develop a, a series of programs that capitalize on collaboration with other uh, parts of the federal government, with the private sector, and with academia in order to advance the science. So for example, uh, uh, ODS co-fund uh, grants with all of the NIH institutes and centers that relate to dietary supplements. A particular example of that is the CARBON program, Centers for Advancing Research on Botanical and Other Natural Products, which is done largely in collaboration with the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. A, a, a very specific program at the uh, Office of Dietary Supplements and one that was called for in congre congressional language early in our lives uh, was the Analytical Methods and Reference Materials Program. And I'll speak to that uh, briefly in a moment. Uh, other programs are related to databases. So, uh, and I'll talk about that briefly. Then a number of uh, nutrient specific initiatives were developed over the years, the most prominent of which was vitamin D, and it included a program that standardized the, the measurement of vitamin D status. It's still going on, the vitamin D standardization program, but it's no longer housed at the uh, ODS. Other programs include population studies uh, uh, that form the basis for some of the work I presented a little bit earlier, and then a program for workforce development. Let me go through a couple of these just to give you an idea. The analytical methods program was developed in the early part of the, uh, of the 2000s to develop laboratory tools such as methods and reference materials to assist in the verification of manufacturers' label claims and in quality control. Uh, that's expanded over the years to include quality assurance programs so that laboratories who wish to participate can uh, uh, evaluate their own uh, competence in measuring product con contents and also in measuring nutritional biomarkers in, in blood samples, things like vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids. The program also provides workshops on methodologies for characterizing supplements and for improving laboratory performance. Uh, uh, the program also validates methods that are used in biomedical research on botanicals and other dietary supplement ingredients. The website contains a searchable database of uh, analytical methods 
that, uh, in, that are in current use. And the overall goal is to enhance the foundation for rigorous dietary supplement development and research, regulation, and, and good uh, quality of products. Um, I think we jumped one here. Yeah. Uh, the second program I wanted to briefly mention was the Dietary Supplement Database Program. There are three in the program, two that uh, relate to products. One is a label database. As I mentioned, there is no requirement uh, currently in the U.S. for the product uh, registration with any uh, uh, arm of the federal government. But uh, ODS was uh, called on by the, government, uh, by the Congress quite a number of years ago to develop a label database that contains basically a, a, a recapitulation of all the data from the, from the labels uh, of products in the marketplace or that have left the marketplace. So currently there are 120,000 labels and I'm told that they're still adding as many as a thousand new labels a month. It doesn't, it has to stop somewhere obviously uh, and I'm not trying to tell you that there are 120,000 products that are in the marketplace right now. I don't know how many there are. This database contains labels from products that are both on the market or products that have no longer, uh, that are no longer on the market or have been changed uh, with time. The ingredient database, by contrast, provides analytically de derived information on the amount of ingredients of some widely consumed dietary supplement products like multivitamins, omega-3s, uh, prenatal vitamins, and green tea. And this is, exclu this is a, a very important collaboration with the Agricultural Research Service at the USDA. And finally, uh, we also maintained a, a database of uh, research grants on dietary supplements, uh, both from the NIH and from other uh, agencies that fund research in this area. A workforce development program uh, provides training and career development awards uh, in collaboration with our NIH partners. Uh, I keep saying our, uh, it's theirs now, um, but I guess I've, I'll never stop being part of ODS. Um, we sponsored uh, uh, intramural scholars awards with the intramural program uh, at the NIH. We collaborated with federal agencies to support postdocs uh, for example, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology and USDA, short-term training opportunities at ODS, and importantly, an annual dietary supplement research program uh, practicum that uh, uh, provided people with much information about issues on dietary supplements and the, uh, and the scientific uh, issues there. At the end of the day, this is what we really wanted to do, and that was to translate the results of science, whether it was done by ODS, supported by ODS, or by other organizations, to communicate the science of supplements. And this was done in a number of ways. Media inquiries and questions from the public about dietary supplements were, are, were and still are regularly handled. There are fact sheets on the, diet on the ODS website, and I've given the website address there. On dietary supplement ingredients and on supplements marketed for specific purposes such as weight loss, athletic performance, and importantly recently uh, a kind of a, a, a digest of issues related to dietary supplements in the COVID era. The website also provides a lot of other information and it still, uh, uh, it still attracts over a million visitors per month to the, to the website, and I'm told that that makes it probably the second most visited website in the, uh, in the NIH family. Um, and this is uh, the health information page where many people go to. In fact, about 80% of the visits to uh, the ODS website are specifically aimed at getting uh, health information from our fact sheets or from other, uh, about other things. And I'm just going to conclude here by telling you that the, the widespread use is important. Supplement products, especially botanicals, can be complex mixtures that create challenges for investigation. Uh, the active ingredients, the multiple components, 
dosing, efficacy, safety, and re reproducibility. And Cynthia Ryder is going to be talking to you about some of the important work on safety that she and her colleagues have done. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize that the resources need to be expanded to deal with these issues, which also extend to the study of bioactives derived from food products. And so I'm going to close with this acknowledgement slide. These are uh, family and friends um, at the uh, NIH Office of Dietary Supplements and in other related agencies, and I owe them a huge debt of gratitude for letting me be their director for such a long time. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Coates. While you're waiting for our next speaker to pull for slides, I would like to remind you to start submitting your questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window. We'll begin the Q&A session after this final presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be with you today to talk about applying the latest toxicology tools to botanical safety evaluation. So to give you an overview of what I'll be talking about today, I'm going to start out and give you some background on the National Toxicology Program and then talk about our rationale for evaluating botanical safety then move on to use of some innovative methods and technologies for understanding botanical safety. And finally, give you some information about a relatively new effort to advance a botanical safety called the Botanical Safety Consortium. So the National Toxicology Program is an interagency program that's headquartered at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences where the division of the National Toxicology Program is. And they come together with the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, the CDC, and the National Center for Toxicological Research at the FDA to form Big NTP. And we test thousands of agents in comprehensive toxicology studies. In addition, we have analysis activities like the report on carcinogens. And our mission is to evaluate agents of public health concern by developing and applying tools of modern toxicology and molecular biology. So although I'll be talking about botanicals today, we have a very diverse portfolio that includes things like cell phone radiation, mold, drinking water contaminants like the per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, polycyclic aromatic compounds. So you may ask, what does the National Toxicology Program have to do with botanicals? Well, the reasons that we study botanicals, as Paul mentioned some of these, because many people take botanical dietary supplements. So there's widespread exposure in the population and recommended doses can be relatively high, unlike some of the other things that we study that are environmental exposures. With dietary supplements, you get hundreds to thousands of milligram of exposure per day. Um, and there are some adverse events that are reported following use of botanicals, as well as um, the fact that safety data are often inadequate. And finally, concerns about quality and integrity of botanical products. So we've been studying botanicals for a while now. Um, this is a list of some of the completed studies we've done on botanical ingredients and some that are still ongoing. And we've learned a lot through that process. How we approach the study of botanicals is we first identify knowledge gaps. So in some cases, we have a very specific concern. So in the case of ephedra, there were adverse event reports about cardiotoxicity. So we wanted to explore those, look at the dose response, and ask questions about how ephedra might interact with other components like caffeine. Other times, there's just a general lack of toxicity and carcinogenicity data, and we want to fill that gap. So once we identify what exactly we want to know, the next step is to identify which test article we're going to use. And this can be extremely challenging in the world of botanicals. So like Paul mentioned, they're very complex mixtures. And our goal is to find a substance that is authentic, so it is what it says it is, and that is re representative of the marketplace. So we want to test something that people are actually being exposed to, not some unique entity. 
And once we do that, we then design fit for purpose studies. So a lot of times we use in vivo models like mice and rats to characterize hazard, but we also use a lot of complementary new approach methodologies to elucidate mechanisms for action or to do some translation between our animal models and the human condition. So I'm gonna talk about um, our use of new approach methodologies in the study of botanicals. But first I wanna walk through how we generally approach um, our studies and dietary supplements. So this is an interesting example that I just wanna talk about for a minute. So vimpacetin, um, as you can see in this marketing information, um, this is a botanical that's a combination of ginkgo biloba with vimpacetin. So it's found in dietary supplements that are aimed at supporting alertness and memory. So this was initially nominated to the National Toxicology for a program for testing. And when we started scoping the issue, we found that although as you can see by the beautiful flowers on the bottle, um, there's, you know, the marketing would suggest that vimpacetin is a natural product that comes from the periwinkle plant. But actually, vimpacetin is a pure synthetic chemical not found in nature that's a derivative of vincamine, which is actually found in the periwinkle plant. Um, in addition to that, there was a relative lack of comprehensive toxicity data. And the data that did exist, there were some signs of potential developmental toxicity, which was summarized in a review article from 1976. So not a lot of details provided, not a lot of information. So in order to fill that data gap, we went ahead and designed a, a study in rodents and sprayed dolly rats, looking at developmental exposure to vimpacetin. So we start with pregnant dams and start the exposure on GD6 via oral gavage to mimic how humans take dietary supplements. And we dose through gestational day 20. And then at gestational day 21, we evaluate both the mothers and the fetuses to look at um, developmental effects. So just to show you a very brief um, bit of data from this study. You can find the rest at this reference below. But um, here's a dose responsive increase was observed in post implantation loss and a dose responsive decrease in live fetuses per litter. So we do see um, important effects on developmental parameters with vincetin treatment. And this was really instrumental in. Um, the FDA putting out a statement warning women of childbearing age about potential safety risks of dietary supplements containing this compound. So uh, just a clear example of data on dietary supplements being used in public health decision making. So while vimpacetin um, is in dietary supplements, uh, it's not like a lot of the botanicals that are very complex mixtures. So from our work on some of the other substances, we've really identified three major challenges that we wanted to dedicate research attention to. And so against that backdrop of very complex substances and all of the challenges that go with that, we thought it was really important to contribute data to being able to compare across these complex botanical products to be able to identify active constituents. And finally, to understand the process that these substances take in being absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and eliminated from the body. So um, next, I want to move into talking about some of the ways we've applied new approach methodologies to some of these challenges. So first, moving to how do we compare across botanicals? So comparing across botanicals is really like complex mixtures read across. Um, we're trying to determine sufficient similarity or in botanical parlance, phytoequivalence of different mixtures. So sufficient similarity is when two mixtures are similar enough that data from one mixture, the reference mixture, can be used to estimate safety or risk from exposure to another mixture, the mixture of interest. So why do we think this is important? 
It's important because there are thousands of products in the marketplace, as Paul mentioned from the Dietary Supplement Label Database, and we're not going to be able to test every single one of those products in comprehensive animal studies. It's just too resource and time intensive. So the example I'll be talking about today is with ginkgo biloba extract. So ginkgo has been used in traditional medicine for a very long time, but current use of ginkgo is often as a leaf-based extract to promote circulation and brain function. But in large epidemiological studies, we didn't really see an improvement in memory with ginkgo biloba extract. And that study was funded by ODS, the GEM study. So it's typically taken in tablet or capsule form with recommended doses of 120 to 240 milligrams per day. And it was selected for testing at the National Toxicology Program based on a lack of toxicity and carcinogenicity data. So when we did actually test ginkgo in the 90 day and two year studies, we found that the liver and thyroid were identified as the main targets of ginkgo biloba toxicity and carcinogenicity in mice and rats. So our key question was, we tested this one sample of ginkgo. Can we use that data from the test article to say something about the safety of other ginkgo biloba products that are available? So how do we go about doing that? Well, first, we have to generate some data both on our reference, which is the NTP test article, and on other varieties of the mixture. Next, we use multivariate statistical approaches to analyze that data, such as principal component analysis or hierarchical clustering, which is shown on the right. Anything to kind of um, decrease the dimensionality of this really complex data so we can easily compare across samples. And then finally, we make a similarity judgment for each of the mixtures that we're comparing to our reference. So in this case, I'll just lay out the very, very simple um, ideas that we used. So if the mixture of interest, so any of the other samples we're testing are in the same group as our reference mixture, we consider them to be similar enough. If they're in the most different group, we consider them to be different. And if they're somewhere in between, we say maybe they're similar, maybe they're different, we're not sure. So now we have to generate some data. Um, we generated a lot of chemistry data, which I'll talk about briefly in a minute, but I wanna focus on some of the new approach methodologies that we used to generate the bioactivity data. So as I mentioned, the liver was seen as the target in the animal studies. So we wanted to move into human systems, but we have to test all these different vari variations of ginkgo. So we can't use animal studies. So we turned to human primary hepatocytes, and there we looked at endpoints, um, including expression of genes indicating activity of key metabolizing enzymes in the liver, like um, aryl hydrocarbon receptor um, through looking at CYP1A2. We also used a novel um, method called the adagene factorial assays in hep G2 cells, which are immortalized cells from human liver carcinoma. Um, and here we looked at numerous different transcription factors and nuclear receptor activity. So how do we combine all this data to make judgments about sufficient similarity? So here we start with the chemistry data and I'm just picturing the chromatograms from a subset of ginkgos that we tested. So we take this non-targeted data that gives us an idea of all the different components that are present without specifically identifying them. We can also look at targeted chemistry to look at marker constituents. And what we do is we can calculate the distance based on that chemistry data from our reference. So this is a line plot where we have our reference mixture, that's number one, at the left of the line plot. And as you move away from that, these are all individual samples and their chemistry gets more and more divergent from our reference ginkgo until we get to H. So here you can see H is just a flat line. This had nothing in it that we were looking for, nothing indicating it was ginkgo, and that's the most chemically different from our reference ginkgo. 
So then we, we generated our bioactivity data. So here's an example of what the bioactivity look, data looks like. It's dose response data for this gene expression of CYP2B6, which indicates car activity. And what we can do is we then put that data into the hierarchical cluster and we make decisions about similarity to our reference. And then we paint that on top of our chemistry data. So here, the green circles indicate that those samples had similar bioactivity data to our reference. The red circles indicate that there was different bioactivity data. And the yellow indicates that ah, was on the fence. It might be somewhere, it might be different. And what you can see is in this ginkgo example, the chemistry and the biology line up really well. We get a lot of green where we have a lot of chemical similarity. We get a lot of red where we have a lot of chemical diversity down here. And so when, once we look at that all together, we can decide, make an informed decision about what is similar enough and what is different. So here we made the decision that everything on the left side of this intersect we're gonna say is similar enough, meaning that our data can be applied to those products. And it makes sense. It, we, we can have confidence that it applies. Um, everything on the right side, we don't have as much confidence. You would probably need to analyze and see what was in there because it's definitely not like Ginkgo. So um, you'd have to generate a new set of data. So that's one example of applying some novel approaches to the important questions that we face in botanical dietary supplement safety. Another example is I'm, I'm gonna talk about with black cohosh extract. So black cohosh extract is used um, for premenstrual pain and other um, menopause uh, symptoms, gynecological symptoms. And with black cohosh extract, we evaluated it in vivo and we found some signs of genotoxicity. So we saw that in um, mice, it induced micronuclei formation. And so what we wanted to ask in this case, after going through the sufficient similarity exercise with black cohosh too, we found that all of the black cohoshes we tested um, showed the same induction of micronuclei formation. So we wanted to identify what is the active constituent in that black cohosh extract that's causing that endpoint. So first we extract the samples with different solvents, and then we run them through this in vitro micronuclei induction assay. And we see this dose responsive increase. Um, so we can identify the active extract. Then we can go through multiple separation steps. And again, we can test each of those fractions until we get to a simple enough mixture where we can isolate and identify the chemical structure that's responsible for the bioactivity we're seeing. So finally, um, the last example I have, I have of applying these new approach methodologies to botanicals is using the TOX21 platform. So TOX21 or toxicology in the 21st century is a giant effort um, that's a collaboration between NTP and FDA and EPA looking at using in vitro assays that measure different stress endpoints and different nuclear receptor activities um, and in a more automated way so that we can run through multiple, multiple chemicals. So a, a 10,000 different chemical structures were tested in the TOX21 program. And what we wanted to do with botanicals would see how does the activity of botanicals stack up to that library of 10,000 individual compounds. And I don't have time um, to spend a lot of time discussing this exact project. I have a reference at the bottom, but what we see is um, the same spread of activity is seen with botanicals as we see with the individual chemicals in the TOX21 program. So all of this is interesting and it, it informs our research on botanicals, but we really wanted um, to have a more concerted effort to increase the toolbox available to evaluate botanical safety. So to do that, we are participating in a public-private partnership with the FDA and with the Health and Environmental Sciences Institute, HESI, um, in order to launch the Botanical Safety Consortium. So the Botanical Safety Consortium 
is involved in um, work to expand the tool toolbox available for botanical safety evaluation. First, we want to engage with a broad range of global stakeholders. Next, we want to establish what level of chemical characterization is recommended. Um, we want to identify fit for purpose in vitro and in silico tools. So here we're focused exclusively on in vitro and in silico tools, not in vivo. Um, and then we want to evaluate the performance of those tools with the standard, so animal studies, human data. Next, we want to integrate and develop a framework for botanical evaluation. And finally, throughout this process, communicate, share our advances and all data, make all data available. So just to give you an idea of the workflow that we are engaged in, I'll take the genotoxicity technical working group as an example. So we have technical working groups in different areas that are priorities for botanical safety, including hepatotoxicity and cardiotoxicity, but I'll just focus on genotoxicity for a moment. So we have the genotoxicity working group, and they are currently engaged in identifying botanicals with known genotoxicity. So they have known genotoxic profiles, both positive and negative. And they're also identifying recommended in vitro and in silico methods for evaluating genotoxicity. Next, we take those botanicals and we review the literature for everything that's known about their genotoxic profile, including from animal studies, from any human data that's available. Um, and then we also take the botanicals and do careful chemical characterization of those. Next, the botanical library is tested in the recommended approaches. And finally, we evaluate the assay performance. Um, and in the last phase, we make recommendations and identify areas for development. So is there some biological space that doesn't have adequate coverage? Do we need to do more methods development in any of the areas that are identified? So we're currently engaged in that effort, and I encourage you to, to check out the website for the Botanical Safety Consortium to learn more about our efforts. So some take home messages um, from my talk are that botanicals present an important public health challenge due to their widespread use, high doses, and complex chemistries. And while animal studies represent an important tool for evaluating the safety of botanical ingredients, predictive new approach methodologies are needed for more rapid and cost-effective screening purposes. So I talked about a couple of uh, examples where in vitro assays have been successfully applied to determine sufficient similarity of complex botanical mixtures and identify active constituents through bioassay-guided fractionation. And two things we've noted in our work here is that there's been good correlation between what we see in vivo in the animal studies and the responses that we're getting in human cells. And um, these approaches allow for testing of numerous samples. So we couldn't really run through those tests, um, both in the sufficient similarity and the bioassay guided fractionation. They require testing multiple, multiple samples. So they're really useful for that. And finally, that the Botanical Safety Consortium is dedicated to expanding the toolbox of methods available for botanical assessment and providing a recommended framework for evaluating botanical safety. And with that, I want to thank um, all those people at the Division of the National Toxicology Program and the Botanical Safety Consortium Steering Committee who have been involved in the work that I talked about today. And with that, I think I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we are now moving to the um, Q&A um, section of this webinar. Um, we already have a couple of questions, um, but if you want to ask our speakers a question, please type them into the, the Q&A box. So we have one here. Um, uh, uh, there you are, Dr. Coates. Um, can you say more about the wisdom or lack thereof of taking vitamin D3 
Um, we have been hearing a lot about this, especially during um, the pandemic. Um, so could somebody comment on vitamin D? Sure, it's probably the one of the most frequently talked about dietary supplement ingredients. And it, it, it's for a good reason. I mean, we need vitamin D and it's, uh, it has important functions in the body. The data, however, from uh, efficacy and effectiveness studies really doesn't strongly support the use of vitamin D, especially in high doses, uh, for health effects other than, than those related to bone health. Uh, repeatedly, studies have identified small to uh, small to no benefit against uh, uh, health outcomes such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, and so on. There have been some exceptions, but usually the effects are small. And uh, that doesn't mean it, it's not a good thing. Uh, in fact, I might worry if the effects were really, really, the benefits were really, really strong because I'd then be looking for those people who did not benefit and perhaps were harmed by those very high doses. So uh, the answer is that uh, it's worth trying. Uh, I would venture to say that uh, doing this under a physician's or healthcare practitioner's care is a smarter idea than making the decision on your own. Uh, there are very legitimate um, reasons for uh, say endocrinologists to want to uh, to prescribe vitamin D in perhaps in high doses for specific kinds of conditions, but beyond that, um, uh, I recommend caution. Great, thank you so much. Um, we had another question: um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act gives the federal government the authority to do a good job keeping our food safe, an excellent job making our drugs safe and effective, a poor job of keeping toxic substances out of cosmetics. What about food substances? Um, does the government have sufficient authority to make sure they are safe and effective? You talked about the sum, but could you, yeah. could you repeat a little sure. bit? Just a reminder, uh, and maybe I didn't uh, take this uh, to the logical uh, extreme. The Food and Drug Administration does have the authority to pull drugs, uh, dietary supplements from the market should there be sufficient evidence of uh, a safety concern. Example, ephedra containing dietary supplement products and some of the replacements for those. Some of the products that contain actual drug ingredients uh, should be targets for, for uh, enforcement. That's on the safety side. Effectiveness side, uh, efficacy side, the, uh, the, the FDA really doesn't have a direct role in that. The, the uh, act that created dietary supplements didn't call for regulation based on effectiveness or efficacy, but rather the ability to take unsafe products from the marketplace. So that's one piece. The second piece is arguably there are never enough resources for the FDA to be able to uh, effectively regulate against the huge and uh, growing every day um, uh, bunch of dietary supplement products that appear in the marketplace. Okay. Um, we have one question here. I read about prenatal vitamins being contaminated with lead and other heavy metals. How can consumers make sure that the vitamins they take aren't contaminated? I can try to answer a part of that. Maybe Cynthia has some observations from her own side. But um, the... Uh, an, I don't recommend individual products, for example, never did and uh, still won't. But I, I think you can look for some guidelines. Uh, so if products have been um, verified by a validation kind of program like the US Pharmacopeia or uh, consumerlab.com or others like that, then uh, with a seal that appears on the, on the label, that can help you guide uh, uh, guide your decision making. Beyond that, uh, most products in the marketplace are not deliberately contaminated. And I say that, I'll say that 10 times if you want, but some are, and the trouble is you don't know which ones they are. Yeah, we had another question that was about contamination. We know what are the resources available to assure safety and quality control 
we encounter on a regular basis that some weight loss or pre-workout supplements are being adulterated with prohibited ingredients like 1,3 DMAA that are not listed on the label. And I answered that one uh, in the chat, uh, but I'd be happy to reiterate <clears throat> it. Uh, there isn't a single resource. Uh, depends on the product, the product category. Uh, resources like those that the National Toxicology Program and now the Botanical Safety Consortium provide can be useful. The FDA has an adverse event reporting system uh, that can be useful. Um, if, it, if the ingredient is not on the label, then for example, the ODS Dietary Supplement Label Database won't be able, wouldn't be a, much of a resource for that purpose. And the fact is that there have been some products that are listed on the market that are present in the Dietary Supplement Label Database with ingredients that are not on the label, uh, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a field day. Uh, investigators <clears throat> like Peter Cohen at ha Harvard and his colleagues have provided very useful information about things like DMMA, DMAA in, in certain ingredients and raise, the, uh, uh, raise our awareness about that. So that's another source of information. I will also add that the American Botanical Council puts out an adulteration bulletin for some botanicals that lists what has been identified as contaminants in some of those um, products. Right, thank you. Okay, great. Dr. Ryder, we had um, one, uh, someone asked, how does NTP select which um, NAMs they will use for botanicals or otherwise? That's a great question. So. Um, Usually we try and look at matching up what we saw in vivo to the available in vitro method. So for the liver toxicity we saw with ginkgo, we used human hepatocytes and that assay in particular was selected because it's a, a common assay that FDA has um, used to identify drug-drug interactions. So we like to look for assays that are um, accepted in the community and line up with what we saw in vivo. Great. Um, Dr. Coates, do you foresee a time in the future where symptom claims can be made with supplements? Uh, I'm not an expert in that area at all, but uh, it would seem to me that there'd have to be a substantial change in the law that permits dietary supplements to be in the marketplace, i.e. A, uh, a reworking of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. Absent that, no. Okay. Um, someone has asked, when you address whether the FDA is able to adequately address, um, oh, okay, you said that you talked to Peter, you talked about Peter Cohen's studies. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, someone asked, is anyone looking at low dose effectiveness versus high doses? Um, I was also going to ask about time period versus, uh, so um, how do how do researchers assess whether or not you're taking, let's say, vitamin D or something over a short period of time or over, you know, the course of many people take multivitamins for years? Yeah. So the, a big challenge, uh, a general challenge to these kinds of studies is that resources, financial resources are not infinite and can't, um, can't answer. Uh, we have not been able to answer every one of those questions. So uh, dosing is a challenge. Uh, so we, we know what we know, but there are plenty of pieces of that dose response curve that we, we haven't filled in, even for something like vitamin D, which has been extensively studied. Uh, the very long-term exposure uh, is a, a big issue because uh, there are no federal agencies like the NIH that are likely to fund uh, um, eight year studies of multivitamins in an otherwise healthy population. It's a, it, in my view, it is a needed piece of information, but against some of the other priorities that funding agencies have, this may not rise to the top. And it, it does represent a limitation in the available information. Sometimes we have to do some guesswork. Great. Um, we had one about, um, I think for Dr. Ryder, what kind of pre-market data is available for botanical supplements? How are the recommended dose levels determined and reviewed? If reviewed, are there opportunities to request additional data? 
So I think as Paul mentioned in his slides, there isn't a, a, a pre-market data isn't required for botanical dietary supplements as long as they were in the market prior to 1994. So they're all grandfathered in um, at the time of Deshay. Um, so how are recommended dose levels determined? That I'm not really sure about. Maybe Paul knows the answer to that one. I wish I did, no. <laughs> But I don't think there's much review um, happening and not a lot of opportunities to request additional data. There are if you have a new dietary ingredient. So if you go into the Amazon and find a completely new plant that you want to bring into the marketplace that wasn't there prior, then you have to do a new dietary ingredient, um, about, put that to the FDA um, for information. Um, we had one, I think that was a little bit about, um, for you, Dr. Ryder, when I did fractionation based on the polarity of the organic solvent, after the materials were separated into various fractions, sometimes I find the function is gone. Do you have any experience on this? So that's a, probably a better question for our lead chemist, Saramia, who is wonderful and works on all things botanical with me. Um, we haven't seen that with black cohosh yet, um, but I wonder if there are different fractions that are interacting to cause the effect that was seen with the whole mixture. So I guess that's one idea about testing whole mixtures is that you have interactions among chemicals that lead to the observed effect and that when you separate them out, there's the potential to, to decrease the activity, but I, I haven't personally had that experience. Okay. Um, those are all the questions that we have um, in the Q&A. Um, I did want to say that the recording of this presentation will be sent out to everyone who, um, who signed up. So if you are not, uh, if people are not able to join live, they can watch later. And I'll turn it back over to you, Hannah. Thank you so much um, for both of our speakers. Great. Thank you so much, Karen, and to both of our speakers, Cynthia and Paul. We're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Shay's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next Young EDC Scientist Showcase webinar, Potential Endocrine Disrupting Effects of Microplastics in Human Placenta and Aquatic Life, will take place December 1st. You can find details on our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to Shay and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, sign, in, sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you, if you appreciate these Chase Partnership webinars, bringing the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support Chase's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Paul and Cynthia, for taking time to present today. And to you, Karen, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us. We're wishing all much health and wellness. Have a great day. <laughs>